Once described as the world's greatest living explorer in the Guinness Book of Records, he is an adventurer and holder of several endurance records and the only man to have ever travelled around the Earth's circumpolar surface. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to draw a connection between his observations about nature's most dangerous and difficult challenges and the day-to-day -day hurdles that we all face. So please join me in welcoming Ranulph Fiennes. Thank you very much indeed. Honoured to ask the conference. Um, I'm going to speak for about eight minutes just to explain why I do as a profession uh, what I do, which is to lead expeditions to break uh, existing world records um, before our enemy, the Norwegians, do. Um, even though you can plan for years and nobody will pay you a penny for doing it, so it's a pretty stupid choice of profession, but there you go. Then I hopefully will show some pictures of some of the package holidays which we've been doing for a total of uh, 42 years uh, with a group of people from nine different countries, 52 people in the group, um, and really nothing in common between these guys uh, other than the fact that I have never paid anybody anything at any time. So there is no sort of financial motivation, and yet they are still coming 40 years later. Obviously, quite a few are dead, so they're not, but the other ones uh, are still with us, sort of thing. Um, I have to say that 40% of the records we tried to break, we have uh, failed, but we do include as failures when we have broken the existing world record but not got to the final goal. Uh, if you do get to the final goal, what we do is to make a lot of noise about it in the media, because that is what the sponsor wants, and to us the sponsor is God. Also, obviously, if you get there, you stick your flag there before anybody else puts their flag in the same place especially the French. And I would say, if we have been any good at doing it over the years, it's probably due to the selection of the individual people on the team. And I used to keep that to myself. And if I'm looking at somebody maybe to take them on, I don't give them one out of 10 on their characteristics or anything complex like that. I only go for their motivational factor because how a person is motivated is how they behave for themselves and therefore for their company or their expedition group. So before an interview, I need a clear definition of motivation. And I don't know if you remember a famous Irish psychologist called Anthony Clare. Anyway, he was, he was asked to define motivation in a single sentence, which he clearly did not do, because the Irish cannot define anything in a single <laughs> sentence. But what he did say is that motivation is something which happens to everybody when they're a teenager. They go to school, they meet a professor who they respect, who one day says something illuminating which sticks in their head and forms the basis of their motivation through life thereafter, which is obviously a load of rubbish. In fact, how you are motivated is the sum total of everything which has happened to you personally since you were little and how you reacted to it or possibly even before you were little, it may be genetic. If you're born stupid, you'll probably stay stupid. <laughs> if you go to school and you get badly bullied, this can have a big effect on how you interact so socially, uh, even if you don't know it. And I think the system of only selecting people on motivation normally works very well, except obviously there are exceptions to everything. And I've been in a hostile area with somebody for two months and thought they were brilliant and then noticed a flaw in their character which could be dangerous later on. And I have to say, in our team, if we notice that sort of thing, what we do is to sack them instantly. None of this sort of sideways British promotional pussyfooting, which just keeps your rotten apples in the barrel. Uh, you, you might think it's all very well me talking about that sort of thing, but in the real world, of course, you're not allowed to, industrial relations and all that. But we do have problems. In Antarctica, you can sack them, but you can't get rid of them. <laughs> um, I think from my own point of view, probably my motivation goes back to when I got born in um, Windsor, outside the castle, obviously, at a time 
when it was being bombed during the war, which my mother did not like. So she moved all of my sisters and me, aged one, out to South Africa for 12 years without consulting us. And I have to say, it was a, a very nice place to get brought up, except that academically, it was way behind the UK. Today, it may be the other way around, but that's the way it was. So when we all got back here, my mother had no money. She was looking for somewhere to educate us and was very happy when she found a place called Winchester College, which took anybody totally free of charge if your family name was Fines. This was basically because the bloke that built the college 800 years ago had been called Fines and liked the idea of lots of little Fineses going there free. <laughs> um, also because in those days there were very few of us, so it was economically safe for the college. But more recently, we started to breed like rabbits, uh, mostly actors, and it became unsafe for the college. So they changed the rules, and after that, you could only get in free if you got the top level of entrance exam. And due to my African background, I got the bottom level, and they would not accept me, to my mother's disappointment. In fact, the only place which would take people with such a low level of intelligence was, of course, Eton College. So I went there for about five years, but my level was so low I couldn't even keep up with theirs. But luckily there was uh, boxing, which did not require too much intelligence, and also, of course, uh, stegophily. Uh, stegophily is if you get born with an edifice complex, meaning you like to climb tall edifices at night in order to put things on top to annoy the school authorities. <laughs> And over those five years at Eton, I learned, I think in the 1950s, British architects stopped using proper steel drain pipes outside buildings, switched to plastic ones, which very often break when you get up to the fourth floor. So from an academic viewpoint, therefore, Eton was not a total waste of time. But going back to motivation, my mother realised that if I stayed there, I wouldn't be able to do the only thing that I wanted to do since I was little, which was to become the commanding officer of the Royal Scots Greys Cavalry Regiment, which my dad had been commanding when he got killed in the war. Uh, in his day, this regiment had 600 grey horses, quite romantic, and also in order to get to be a regular British officer, Sandhurst, you did not require things called A-levels. But by the time I arrived on the scene, the regiment had switched from horses to tanks, even though it was the British Army, and also, you couldn't get to Sandhurst if you didn't have your A-levels. So my mother removed me from Eton, because she knew if I stayed there, I would not get them. Places badly designed for getting people A-levels. And I was sent to a famous place in Brighton called Davis's. And if you went there, when you came out the other end, you definitely had your A-levels. And I'm not at all proud of having broken their record. Uh, <laughs> This was not my fault, because at that time was the height of the mini-skirt era, and concentration was not possible, so I failed the A-levels twice. But obviously, if you can't get where you want, like Sandhurst, you've got to find an alternate route. And I found a place in Aldershot called Mons Cadet School. And if you went there for five months and could prove to the Sergeant Major that under a situation of great stress, you could dig holes in straight lines, you could become an officer in the British Army. <laughs> so I did this and I got sent out to Germany. It was the Cold War at that time. And I spent the next five years in tanks, learning how to retreat from the German border. <laughs> did not practice advancing, which got pretty tedious. So when I saw a notice on the regimental board asking for officers to apply for the SAS, I put my name down not because I knew anything about the SAS. In those days, nobody had ever heard of them. It was before Harold Wilson started to use them for PR purposes. I had obviously heard of Scandinavian Airline services, but not the regiment. So I got sent to Hereford, which is where you go to get selected for the unit. And I found there were 190 soldiers trying to get in, 30 other officers, pretty much all of them built like brick houses many ex-para, none of them came from a cavalry regiment. They called me a donkey walloper. So, <laughs> to be honest, I was quite happy when this lot got ruthlessly eliminated in only 10 days, down to only three soldiers and two officers. And to my surprise, I was still there. I think 
probably because they were selecting people from a physical, not intellectual point of view. But sadly, on the 11th day, they switched. So I had to try to become alert. And I can remember, if you failed anything, you got thrown out immediately. And what me and the other remaining officer were having to do one night was to cross the local river outside Hereford by night in winter with no clothes on for some military reason. <laughs> so I woke up extremely knackered the following morning at about 11 o'clock. You're meant to get up at 6 o'clock. And I panicked because they leave your instructions on your bed every morning. And what it was that particular day was to steal £200,000 from the local bank in Hereford in great detail, which the SAS check after. I had Barclays, the other officer had Lloyd's. So I rushed down to the town, but the bank was already closed, so I could not get in to do a careful burglary plan. So I went round the back and I banged on the back window, and luckily the bank manager came out. He was a charming bloke, very naive. And I explained I'd come from Germany. I was trying to get into the SAS. I had brought all my family silver with me. This bit was not true. And he said, no problem. We at Barclays are extremely secure. He showed me all the electronic burglar system. So I thanked him. And in those days, carbon paper, I copied the bank raid plan in great detail, one copy to the SAS just in time. And me and the other bloke had the day off. So we went up to Birmingham. We saw a film and had a spaghetti dinner. And very stupidly after dinner, I left my copy of the bank raid plan in the restaurant. And the manager, later in court, basically <laughs> gave the plans to the police. There was a ministerial inquiry in Westminster, front page of the Times, why SAS officers were stealing from banks. I was up before the commanding officer, who basically said, any more behavior like this, and I would be thrown out of the SAS immediately. So for the next year or so, in the regiment, in different parts of the world, doing different things, I behaved pretty well. But briefly back here, unfortunately, I got phoned by an old Eton friend, who by that time, like most of them, had become a wine salesman in the West Country. <laughs> and during the course of selling his stuff in pubs, he had discovered a village called Castle Coombe, which had just been voted Britain's prettiest village by the Americans. And it was being attacked by 20th Century Fox, making a film in this beautiful village called Dr. Doolittle, which involved turning the trout stream thatch cottages into a dirty great lake for filming uh, using a 20-foot concrete, 20-foot high concrete dam, ruining the village. And my friend decided to bring this outrage to the general attention by blowing up the entire concrete dam the night before the film started. It's a good PR plan. Unfortunately, the police got to hear about it, so they put Alsatian dogs all over the dam. But my friend had been at Eton, so he was up to that one. What he did was to rent eight Alsatian bitches in order to put them upwind of the dam. But at the last minute, the bitches failed to turn up, so he phoned me to ask if I would stand in. Uh, because I had just completed an army explosives course where you learn to blow up as much as you can using as little as possible. And I was pretty good at this, so I had a lot left over at the end of every day. <laughs> it seemed stupid to give it back to Her Majesty, so I put it in the boot. And two months later, the boot was full and sweating. And what better way of getting rid of it than this public-spirited gesture? Unfortunately, everybody was caught. Uh, I was not physically caught. I'd been doing another army course on escaping from dogs by night. But <laughs> They had the car numbers. I ended up in Chippenham Prison. I was on police probation for six months. I was thrown out of the SAS, back to my own regiment, who were still retreating from the German border. <laughs> well, I put up with that for about another year, and then I saw a notice on the regimental board asking for officers to apply for SAF. Um, you may not remember, but back then, world Marxism was doing extremely well. They had just chucked the Brits out of the Yemen and we're about to move into the Oman in order to block 80% of the free world's oil coming out of the Gulf. Therefore, the socialist prime minister here agreed to send the Sultan of Oman a massive show of military strength, uh, which he did. There were about nine of us at that time. <laughs> and I can remember applying to the colonel for the job, but all the other applicants were coming out looking unhappy because they had been turned down due to being too valuable to the regiment. But uh, my application went through immediately. <laughs> and what the Ministry of Defense think is you cannot command Arabs in the dark being shot at by communists 
if you cannot speak Arabic. So first of all, you get sent to the best place in the world for learning Arabic, according to the ministry, which is uh, Beaconsfield in North London. <laughs> I did fail the course, but I was still sent out. And on arrival, you meet your, shall we say, works team for the first time. Piratical looking group. There were 60 of them. Most I discovered were actually Baluchi, so they could only speak Urdu. Many of them were Zanzibaris who spoke only Swahili. And the few that did speak Arabic had not been to Beaconsfield. <laughs> so we ended with a major communications problem. But it was probably out there that I began to get a taste for travel in very remote parts of the world. Uh, this is the navy of the Sultan of Oman, <laughs> the army. Um, this is my reconnaissance platoon, normally very well disciplined, but on this occasion we're about to attack the communist-held machine guns on the Rakhuti coast, so they were sort of apprehensive and seasick. Uh, that was one half of the Sultan's air force, um, photograph obviously from the other half. I can only point at one screen, uh, and I think more people over here, so if you look quickly, over on the right, typical um, Omani, Zanzibari, Baluchi, myself, European, all of us were of course Muslim, uh, I was Muslim for the three years I was out there. We were 180 in all in the Sultan's army in Dofar, South Oman, there was a D notice slapped on the war, nobody was allowed to report on it. It was very vicious. We had no helicopters to remove the wounded. The opposition, between three and 4,000, we were heavily outnumbered, were in command of the mountains. Now, you think of Arabia as sand like that, which is true 99%, but the 1%, the size of Wales, is forests and uh, waterfalls and rivers and so on because of a local monsoon, and that was where the war was going on. My predecessor, a Scottish officer, had been killed in a Land Rover, and I therefore changed everything. They didn't like it at all, but I said, right, we're got going with the Land Rovers anywhere near the forested area, keep them out in the desert. At dark, we will then move 20 miles quickly, lay your ambushes, and then get back out again. And we will not move as a group of 60, big target. We will split to little groups of four with walkie-talkies, two machine guns per group. That way, three years later, we only had four dead, and our own kill rate was very high. But moving around by night, and we only moved by night, uh, in this area was not good because there are more snakes than anywhere else in the world. If you get bitten by an Echis carpet viper, you'll be brain dead in two seconds. And we have the PM, which is even quicker. That is a Soviet anti-personnel mine. Uh, this is not in a cave, but um, a lot of the time on the Yemeni border, we sat in dark caves over the killing ground waiting for the Idarat political execution squads to come in from the Yemen to do extremely nasty things to the Muslim tribal leaders to change them into Marxists. We were there to kill them before they came across the border. But you could be sitting in a cave waiting for six days and nights, which is all the water we could carry, being bitten silly by ticks and fleas, and nothing happens, so it gets very boring. I was on leave three years later in London. I went to the Natural History Museum because no botanist had ever been allowed into this country and the British Museum were keen on new lizards from there. I got trained to photograph and um, measure them and all that sort of thing. If you do go to the Natural History Museum, uh, do go into the scorpion department. There is a 28-inch black scorpion with my name on it in Latin. I'm very proud of it. I stroke it when I go there. These chameleons uh, grow to 23 inches long, and if you put them on a green leaf, they will go green. Put them on a red flower, they will actually turn red. Uh, people say if you put them on a tartan blanket, they will explode. <laughs> um, people, pretty interesting. We had to recognize 16 tribes, very often by the scars on their faces, know which ones have gone Marxist, like the Bautachauri, the Machra, the Shakra, the Beit Kathiri, and so on. This lot, the Baudahari, were descended from the Queen of Sheba from Ethiopia at the exact biblical time when Solomon was king up north in Jerusalem. And she attacked Dofar because it was and is the only country in the world where frankincense trees grow. And you might say, well, so what? Well, that cost a lot more than gold during the Roman Empire. 
So it was a good place to actually colonise, which she did, but by the time I got there, incense had lost its value and the people were very poor. If you can try and imagine that you were born and lived your life in that house of three rooms, which is what it is, they, I knew the family very well, there were 15 lived there. Um, once incense lost its value, they were dependent basically. If you look at that uh, right-hand side, sitting room, in the middle you've got a kitchen for 15 humans, garage over on the left, and that's it. Camel milk is what they survive on, no grass, no milk. You put your house on your camel and you wander off to try and find more grass. Not much of a life. One of our Land Rovers there, we did try to help them for six months, but then we got heavily ambushed doing so, and also we had a lot of work on the other side of the mountains. We, just six vehicles, patrolled the entire Saudi, Yemeni and Omani border over a three-year period, moved too many times on the same track, and uh, they will lay uh, anti-tank mines, which will blow a Land Rover 100 metres, and the people quite a lot further than that. I had to leave the Sultan's army after three years, not because I wanted to, but because I was thrown out of the British army due to lack of A-levels and no Sandhurst, no commission. Eight years was your lot. So when I left, I got married. She also had no money, about 1968. And the only thing we decided that I could do to make an income was what I had been doing in the Cold War in Germany, which was teaching Scottish soldiers how to canoe, climb and ski in order to stop them beating each other up in the naffy, which they were increasingly doing because they were bored stiff because the Soviet army never bothered to attack. Now, that was called adventure training and paid for by the taxpayer. Doing it with my wife, sponsorship became the new word and still is today. In the early days, uh, my wife, my late wife Jenny of 38 years and I started looking for the lost incense city which the Queen of Sheba had built thousands of years ago. We knew that it was somewhere in the greatest desert in the world. 1968, the first expedition to look for it, archaeology basically, went back nine major expeditions over 26 years before we found the lost city in 1992. Other expeditions in the early days, basically we, uh, well, Ginny had the ideas at breakfast usually and she decided that we would do the first ever journey up the longest river in the world, which is the Nile at 4,000 miles long, using Hover Hawk's two-seater hovercraft, which were pioneered at that time. The reason she wanted to use them, in the Guinness Book she had read that they had the world record for hovering without a breakdown for eight hours around a gravel pit in Peterborough, therefore obviously the right model for the Nile. <laughs> they had three motorbike engines which could lift them two centimetres above the surface. Uh, we took nine months to complete the Nile, partly because there were a lot of four centimetre obstacles. <laughs> uh, another expedition, just to give you an idea of how different they were, 1971, British Columbia in Western Canada was a province of Canada for 100 years. They had a centenary. They had been discovered by Scotsmen using rivers they are bigger than three Great Britons, British Columbia alone, but full of forest and the Rocky Mountains. Nobody had ever managed to get from their northern border by river 2,000 miles by nine rivers to their southern border at Vancouver. They wanted a Scottish group to do this in the centenary year because they'd been discovered by Scotsmen using the rivers. I was asked to lead the expedition because I was on the Army Reserve and the army said that in return I could have a support Land Rover BER. I later discovered that meant beyond economical repair. <laughs> also that if I went to Edinburgh out of the regiment I could select the three best soldiers out of 600. But when I got there I found they'd all been posted to Ireland apart from the cooks. So choice was not good. But I did find a very fine Scotsman called uh, Joseph Skabinski. And the... <laughs> Three of them were given a total of six weeks leave. Um, we took nine months, so they were not popular when they got back. <laughs> One of the reasons you might think it's bad planning was because these were the roughest rivers in the world. None of us had ever been on rough water, and yet the ministry only gave us training rights on the Thames at Henley. So when we got to Canada, our learning curve was extremely steep. We had three, four boats, three people in each boat, and on one particular rapid, Hell's Gate, we hit a 28-foot high standing wave. 
One of the boats was flipped and we found their bodies a mile downstream and that could have stopped the entire expedition. But uh, luckily it was just the BBC film crew. <laughs> I think 1970, at breakfast, Jenny decided that we were getting no more sponsorship. Sponsors depend on media coverage. The media in the UK w was no longer prepared to cover hot expeditions. They only wanted cold polar ones. Well, by then, Ginny and I had spent an entire winter in uh, Inverness, but polar-wise, we were not really equipped. She decided, as we were getting a bit old, if we were going to go into the polar competition, we would have to start ambitiously, not by North Pole, South Pole, but by doing the first ever journey around the world, uh, vertically through both poles, crossing both ice caps and the Northwest Passage and the Sahara and everywhere in between. So she sent me to a library to find out the best route. I discovered that at the bottom there was a white bit called Antarctica which did not look good. It had never been crossed from one side to the other. It was far bigger than China and India put together with no Tesco's en route and it didn't look good. Up at top there was another problem uh, which you can't see on that map. The Arctic Ocean, two and a half thousand miles of semi-frozen sea ice never crossed from side to side. So I went home and I told my wife, as, as you would, that it was a stupid idea. She became uh, quite unpleasant, <laughs> so I therefore went back to the library. But basically, if you want to get sponsorship, you've got to be first. Now we knew that, but we had nothing. We were in a semi-detached in Hammersmith, had a Jack Russell and a minivan, and that was it. We knew that we would need an ice-strengthened vessel with a full crew, Lloyd's strained. Uh, we knew that we would need a ski plane for dropping parachutes. Her rule was that we would never fly one metre of the 52,000 mile journey, but you've got to drop off parachutes. Anyway, SAS gave us an office uh, in Sloan Square. It was an old derelict rifle range. Today it's the Morris Saatchi Gallery and no telephone. Now, we needed 1,900 sponsors to get this thing going, 29 million pounds worth of goods. We had no bank account, no checkbook, everything had to be free, that takes time. Um, the SAS had forgotten what I'd been up to previously, that's why they gave us this nice uh, range. But with no telephone, you can't get sponsors. So we found a GPO engineer, territorial soldier, put him out of the attic window at night onto the roof, plugged us into the MOD phone system, and they sponsored us for seven years with free phones. Uh, out of 800 applicants, I only wanted two people to come with me for three years around the world. Uh, out of 800, we selected just one who had been a beer salesman uh, in London for nine years, and the other one in Cape Town had been a butcher. His butcher's business went bust, so he naturally joined the British Army. And the two of them, we chose them on their characters. They had no skill whatsoever, but you can uh, give skills, you can't change characters. Three of us became the land group of the expedition. We eventually hit Antarctica in the sponsored ship. Uh, people on board, as I say, given up their jobs for three years without pay, maybe chief engineers from P&O and so on, from nine different countries. Unloading was a problem, because where you unload, a wind gets up, the ice will break and you'll lose it. Ship then, if you can think about this, went round from the Atlantic right down to the Pacific and waited in New Zealand in the hope that the three of us would manage to be the first humans to cross this whole continent, come out the other send, end, and then send a message for them to come from New Zealand to collect us and take us up for the rest of the expedition. Um, since nobody had ever crossed it, they didn't know that we ever would, but they waited for 18 months in New Zealand. When they'd gone, we moved inland um, from over there, and we moved 400 miles up to 12,000 feet above sea level, it's very cold up there, and we got to the last known feature on Earth, which is that rocky thing on the horizon. Before we could set out from that rock, and we knew that from the rock to the South Pole was 900 miles unexplored, unmapped, no polar satellites, nothing, totally unknown. How high was it? Nobody knew. But before we could even set out into the unknown bit, we had to live for eight months under the snow, because in winter you cannot travel. It gets down to minus 89 degrees centigrade. So we had cardboard huts designed in Scotland by my wife six years earlier. 
very, very light, easy to put up. They crumple after eight months, but we only would need them for eight months. They uh, are insulated down to minus 30, wind protection from a wind of 40 miles an hour before they blow over. Uh, we recorded 166 miles an hour and the temperature of wind chill minus 122. But uh, you might think we got cold and blown over, but because the snow goes up, snow drifts go up to that level quite quickly, which gives you insulation and protection, but then you can't get out. Uh, you might think, why would you want to get out? And basically, uh, it was because we were cooking with petrol in a cardboard house. Um, Ginny became, my wife, the best radio operator after three years in the Royal Signals in Hammersmith. Uh, her frequency prediction was better than Marconi. Her antenna theory was better than the British Antarctic Survey with huge radio sets. And uh, also, we had to learn how to cross crevasses, which in the UK is not possible. Luckily, one collapsed just outside the hut, which gave us good training permission. Um, unfortunately, normally, you cannot see them. It's just white. If you want to know where they are, you tread on them and fall into them, and then you know where they were. <laughs> Eventually, the sun came back after five months' disappearance, day and night. The thermometer rose to minus 68. We said goodbye to the radio, uh, the base commander. That is the nastiest job of all. That's why I gave it to Ginny because the whole thing had been her fault for thinking of it. But she was a small person and could not roll 45-gallon drums around, so a man had to be living with my wife for three years. So I did not want somebody who was physically attractive in that position. But uh, luckily, we found a Yorkshireman for that particular job. <laughs> uh, we did the first ever crossing of the unexplored zone, we mapped it. That is the last time man made a big terrestrial map of the world before satellites arrived down there in the early 1990s. We did the first crossing. We used a tent that weighed 120 pounds. Today it weighs three pounds. But up there you've got catabatic wind that goes from zero to 100 miles an hour in under 30 seconds, which doesn't give you long to fiddle about with your tent pegs. The tent that we used didn't need pegs. It's cleverest design aerodynamically designed by the world's greatest polar explorer of all time, back in 1908. Uh, he is today the most lied about. A great guy, Captain Scott, including when he died down there, he produced more scientific information about Antarctica, including that it was a continent, than all the other polar international expeditions of the first half of the 20th century. We completed the first ever crossing. You know when you get to the Pacific coast, because there's only one volcano that's active, and it is on the coastline. Uh, when we got there, two days earlier, the first ever tourist by air arrived, crashed into the volcano, 160 dead, no way of removing the bodies. But from just beside it, we could see the Pacific Ocean. Uh, if you look very carefully, again, I'm sorry I can't point at the other one, but um, when Ginny made the plan for the entire expedition, she did it off a six-inch school globe with a crayon, so the planning was not precise. When we came out of Antarctica, she reckoned that Morse code message to the ship, it would come through the ice. Two other ships sunk in that ice that year. Ours got through and collected us. Still everybody on board, still unpaid, which was good. Two of them were dead. Took us up the other side via Australia, uh, Los Angeles, Vancouver, through the Bering Straits. That's the Soviet Union, that's Alaska. Now, if the ship tried going through here, up the Greenwich Meridian to the North Pole, it's just a semi-frozen sea, over the other side down to Greenland, uh, it would have sunk. Because in that area there, you have three million tonne ice flows moving at four miles an hour, and if two ice flows hit each other, your ship will sink. So when Ginny made the plan nine years earlier, she decided the ship would go having dropped us off at the mouth of the Yukon River, it would go through the Panama and wait for a year. We and three 12-foot rubber boats would go up the Yukon, 1,200 miles, 800 miles down the Mackenzie River, switch to an open 15-foot plastic boat, try to go 2,500 miles through the Northwest Passage, hoping it wouldn't freeze, 900 miles to the edge of the last island on Earth where we would wait eight months of darkness before doing the polar bit. Her plan 
gave us two months from the mouth of the Yukon uh, to that island. When we got there, we discovered that only three expeditions in history had been through the passage bit, and they'd taken an average of three years to get through. Uh, now, I'm not making a comment on female planning, but they do need to be watched. <laughs> um, we had no problem going up the Yukon, except there were only two of us, because the beer salesman, by then nine years unpaid on the project, was threatened with divorce, so he left. Charlie and I then carried on, Charlie being the South African. If you can picture that, ma well, the map I showed you earlier, the passage above Canada <laughs> as being the black line, 2,000 miles. Because the ice 500 miles away from the pole is all floating in summer against the Canadian coast, in summer you just can't get through at all. We were lucky, big storm for seven days and nights, blew the ice away and we sneaked between the cliffs and the ice. But when we got to the eastern end, 2,000 miles later, where you turn north to the island, the sea began to freeze. It's called grease ice. Two hours without wind, it will congeal to sugar. The sea will freeze, and the boat stayed there, as we later discovered, for the next 11 years. They were quite lucky getting that far. It was a good icy year. But, of course, we had 400 miles still to go, and no boat. Winter was coming, we had the wrong clothing, uh, we used snowshoes, had to cross that lot un unmapped for 400 miles. Charlie, on the left, uh, he basically, in the boat, got soggy foot, and the skin fell off the bottom of one foot, leaving raw nerve. His language got very bad. He then developed hemorrhoids, and it got worse. Then, one day, he fell over and cracked his head open on a rock, and his eyes filled up with blood, and he started to whinge. He basically suggested that we ought to rest. If we had rested at all, the entire expedition would have ended. 52 people all that time, we let them down. Charlie did keep going. He's dead now, sadly. I've got a picture of his better foot at that time. Um, we made it 400 miles just before dark to the edge of the world, where there were two abandoned huts 30 years ago, scientists had been there. And Ginny, in the summertime, in a ski plane, had dug snow out, and that's where we lived. Ginny, Charlie, me, and Ginny's Jack Russell Terrier, which was a pain. But later, at the end of the expedition, it did become uh, pet of the year in the UK, and also got in the Guinness Book as the only dog ever to have peed on both poles. <laughs> uh, we spent eight months in the dark, and then one month before the sun came back in the minus 40s, Charlie and I said goodbye to Jenny and the dog, set out for 300 miles to find the edge of the Arctic Ocean, um, and about 10 days after we left her, she looked out of the window of the living hut, and the store's hut, where all our parachutes and everything were, had caught fire. She did try to put it out, but did a bad job. In the dark, 200 miles away, got a Morse code message, the base camp's burnt down, but you had better carry on, so we did. And uh, steam, remember this was in the dark, all the pictures I took for a month, they came out black, so I can't show them to you, but that is what it was in the dark. Steam is from open water at minus 50. Well, water freezes at minus two, but there is so much movement and noise, it's a hellish place to be in the dark. Cut a long story short, we eventually got 500 miles up over the moving ice to the North Pole and became the first human beings ever to reach both poles. We put a flag there, because people do, but it's pretty stupid, because within an hour, the flag will be a mile away from the pole, because the ice is floating. Uh, if you go there and you want to put your flag there, swim down 17,000 feet to the seabed, put your flag there, and it will stay put. Uh, we did not do that. At that point, we wanted to go to Greenwich, 1,800 miles away, and a compass is all you've got, a magnetic compass, no other way, and of course you've got your, the sun's altitude and your watch on Greenwich or local time. That's how it was. There were no GPS, no sat phone or sat nav. We wanted to go Greenwich, but every destination in the entire world was due south on our compass. This caused a very bad argument between the two of us as to which direction to go in from the pole. We eventually did not get 1,800 miles, which was the safety of where the ship might reach us, we only got 400 before the annual breakup. 
very, very noisy, like tsunami of moving ice. The deep ice where the current is strong, they'll break up everything where you're camped. Very frightening place to be, that's why nowadays people get to the North Pole, a helicopter takes them away before the breakup, but we couldn't. After 400 miles, it was too dangerous, so we found a bit of ice eight foot deep on the drill and hoped we could float towards Siberia for weeks and months. We sat on the ice floe, moving the tent whenever a crack came, never got bored because Charlie on the left had a solar panel which gave us enough power to listen to the BBC World Service uh, for two minutes a day, if there was reception. And I can remember one day with his headsets on, Charlie said, the United Kingdom is at war. So I said, who with? He said, oh, I didn't get that bit. <laughs> um, we sat for five days of bad radio reception, arguing who the hell we could be at war with. Obviously, we knew that Mrs. Thatcher was aggressive, but we couldn't work out who with. I mean, we assumed, obviously, that it was France, but when they <laughs> said, uh, said that it was Argentina, we thought that was just a stupid uh, joke. We never got bored because we were 700 miles from people, and outside the tent, you hear scuffling. Um, we were on a polar bear route. They weigh one and a half tons, um, and they get very hungry. The Canadians had promised us that Canadian polar bears, only 10% of them actually eat humans. But when they're just outside your tent door, you can't really ask which percent they belong to. <laughs> we found that our flow was crumbling. We panicked. Morse code to Southampton for the ship to come up early. They tried too early, hold the hull and began to sink. Cleverly rammed an ice flow so the hull was in the air used oxyacetylene, but they had to go back to Svalbard for two months, and out on the ice we panicked. Luckily, four years earlier, Ginny in Scotland had designed skis for canoes, but when it happened, we never dared get in them. We were too weak. The ice could move at four miles an hour, and we didn't want to get crushed. To cut a very long story short, the ship tried four times to reach us and failed, but got further north than any other ship. Eventually, got to within 25 miles of where we were. If you look carefully, you can see us just down there to the left of the ship. We had been eight and a half months on the moving ice. When we got on the ship, humans, for the very first and last time in the world, had been around Earth vertically, the surface. We were stuck for 15 days. Then the wind changed, and we managed to get down to Greenwich. Uh, within two days of the date planned ten years previously, a uh, very good patron, Prince Charles, of 39 years, we kept our team together. If you've got a good working team, keep them together. We moved into the 80s and 90s to break all world records north and south against uh, all our main enemies, the Canadians, the Norwegians and the Russians. We used British Aerospace technology so we could carry 500-pound loads on very thin ice for the first time. We were able to cross Shugo, which had never been done before, newly forming ice without heavy amphibious gear. Uh, 92, Gorbachev, Perestroika, wrote a letter, Dear Mr. Gorbachev, can I lead the first Western expedition from Siberia to the Pole? Normally it's from Canada to the Pole. Uh, unfortunately, the only place you can actually set out from is also a secret Soviet missile base. So I had to sign a contract, I'd take no photos while there. Uh, I did not, the other members of the team did. Uh, we broke all existing world records that year, but when I got back to London, I have to say, very annoying, NASA was putting cameras on the shuttle flying to 170 kilometers and taking photographs of the Arab desert. They were looking for my lost city in the desert. By then, we were about to find it. We'd been looking for 26 years. That is a NASA professor. If you look at the brown lines are sand dunes, 80 miles between each brown line. Uh, down by the professor is south, north up to the far side of the picture, Saudi Arabia biggest sand desert in the world. Well, what they do is they look, the scientists, at the NASA photo through bioptics, and they can actually see the outline of the lost city, which was way out there north in the desert, and they know that it's a lost city 
because even though the outline is 30 feet under the sand, they can actually see it. It's called uh, cheating. <laughs> they, and they knew that it was a city because it was right angles, and only people make things with right angles, so it must be a lost city. Well, I'm not going to tell you how, but in the UK, we discovered the, the grid reference, according to NASA, eight months before they could mount their expedition. Land Rover gave us eight special vehicles. We moved out 300 miles into the sand dunes to the exact spot that's there where NASA said it was. My archaeologist, Dr. Zarins, the best in the world, took one look at the NASA site and he actually said this is not the lost city. This is a place made by God using right angles in order to fool NASA. We reverted to traditional archaeology and we found the lost city on the 23rd of November. Some of you may have seen it, it's now the biggest excavation works in Arabia. Just to end up with, going to miss out a great number of expeditions. That picture was drawn by Shackleton 1906, that's what he thought Antarctica looked like. His plan from South America, his ship would land, four of them, they would walk to the pole, at which point they would die of hunger, you can't carry enough. So, from Australia two years earlier, Shackleton's other ship would take these guys, they would drop food off there, so that when he got there he could come out. In actual fact, his ship sunk, so he never set out. He couldn't tell the other lot, so they did. They were killed, didn't drop the food off, so if he had got to the pole he would have died anyway, but it was a good plan. <laughs> it was copied 30 years after his death by the great hit climber Hillary, and Fuchs, and between the two of them, using a pincer plan of Shackleton, two expeditions, they did the actual polar crossing. But when I'm talking about, in the 90s, only four of us had ever crossed Antarctica. The blue north side line, that was my wife's journey around the world. The red line, American, 1990. The diagonal, Hillary and Fuchs. And the yellow line, Reinhard Messner and Arved Fuchs, the great German polar man. All of us used air support. Now in the 90s, when I'm talking about, our intelligence unit in Aberdeen, whose only job is to listen in to the Norwegians to know what they're planning, told us that they sneakily were about to try and do the big one in polar terms, cross Antarctica with nothing. So on day one, you have a sledge with 500 pounds and nothing else for 2,000 miles, going up to 12,000 feet, temperatures in summer down to minus 55, enough fuel to keep warm, food for two and a half months. Very heavy, never been done, calorifically we knew it wasn't possible. But when we heard that our main rivals were about to do it, you couldn't give them a clean start, so we quickly switched what we were doing. We caught the only aeroplane going down to Antarctica's biggest airport, that's the control uh, tower. We changed aeroplanes, we flew 1,900 miles over nothing to the start point, which is where the frozen Atlantic hits Antarctica. 100 miles away the same day on the edge the Norwegians set out. The other guy on the team, wearing blue, Dr. Michael Stroud, Britain's top expert physiologist specialising in studying the effects of starvation on the human body. So there is element on this expedition. He monitored our daily output, towing 500 pounds, which over 97 days was an average of 8,500 calories a day. If you run a marathon, you might use 2,000 calories. Couldn't uh, have a single day off, you get diarrhea or the blizzard, you'll never do your 16 miles twice, 32 miles in a day. So you cannot have a rest day in 97 days. You can't wear Gore-Tex or polar fleece, you die of hypothermia have to have 100% breathability. You can't wear normal soft boots to protect your toes like normal. You won't move 500 pounds for a yard, never mind 2,000 miles. You have to have big downhill boots which dig the skins in, then you can pull forward, but that hurts your feet. That's after 10 days, quite painful for an hour, then they get cold and stop hurting. Gangrene, that's after three weeks. We knew we'd have skin grafts after three months. Uh, Sydney, ozone hole, skin cancer. Much worse here, you're under the hole, cover up your skin. 
But remember, you are towing 500 pounds on a dog harness. Every time you move forward, you're breathing like hell. You can't cover up your lips. So they get scabby from the glare. In the tent at night, you go to sleep, lips stick together. Wake up in the morning, you must say good morning to the other man. It's called team dynamics. But you can't open your mouth until you pull the scabs apart. First thing you do is to share porridge out of a communal bowl. So all your blood goes in his porridge, which causes bad relations. <laughs> that bloke is treading on his shadow. The sun is due north at midday. He wants to go south, so he treads on his shadow when his watch says midday. That is how we navigate without uh, any features for 2,000 miles. I took the photograph of the crevasse because I could see it. Normally, though, you can see nothing at all, so I developed a very careful policy which is to watch the bloke ahead. <laughs> Nobody fall, you can see somebody up there, you'd be too stupid to fall into that one. At the pole, the Norwegians dropped out pretty much dead. We were in a very bad way. The only reason we carried on the other half of the journey to the uh, Pacific coastline was because Dr. Stroud had a contract with the Lancet medical magazine on the topic of advanced starvation. And at the pole, he weighed us and discovered that we were starving, even more than he had hoped. And he was determined to complete the article, even if it was posthumous, so we carried on. <laughs> we did the first ever descent of the 9,000-foot Beardmore Glacier without crampons, because we lost them. <laughs> I began to hate uh, him. Basically, I've done 26 years of expeditions with him since then, including next year. But he was taking my blood for science every five days. Didn't have much blood left. Every eight days, he made you drink a container of liquid costing $1,000. And for 24 hours after you drink it, any liquid coming out of any of your orifices has to be collected for science, especially urine. And to fill a pee bottle outside in a wind at minus 90 is dangerous for that part of your body if you are male. Although, obviously, at that temperature, the difference between males and females is not great. <laughs> His hands, the blisters uh, pop, and you get raw skin. Um, I made a mistake a little bit after that, only three minutes, as a result of which, five months later, I had the top half of all those fingers amputated. You do not want to make mistakes at that temperature. Mike and I eventually, in a very bad way, reached the Pacific coastline, the first humans ever to do so, to cross the entire continent uh, with nothing. Today remains the longest polar unsupported journey in history. Back in the UK, we completed 19 muscle biopsies uh, without anaesthetic. Very painful. I enjoyed taking that photo of Mike. <laughs> uh, we raised from that expedition the sum of 4.2 million pounds and started building Britain's first MS research centre. Uh, as of today, we've raised 18.2 million pounds for UK charities. All the expeditions have a charity and a science programme, but from my own personal point of view, that's not it. From my point of view, as I think I mentioned, it's my profession, and what I need is constantly to have sponsorship and to do that, you need to retain your lead over your known rivals at all times. Um, is there any time for questions? Who am I addressing? Here we go. John, do you want questions? Are there any questions from the floor? Well, first a round of applause for yeah. outstanding presentation. <laughs> I think we have some microphones if, uh, if anyone would like to raise a question. It's uh, one over there. Can you get the microphone to Stan, please? Oh, you've got one. Oh, you're, you're, you're just holding the microphone. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about your, your next uh, experience. What do you have planned? Oh, what are we doing next? Yeah. I don't know there's no Norwegians no. in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, in which case, um, uh, <laughs> is, there, is there anything else from the floor? No. Well, first of all, you should all have a copy of Ranulph Fine's book and um, be happy to sign those. But equally important, if out by the reception, the latest book, which you've entitled? 
uh, cold. Cold, very appropriate, <laughs> is also available uh, outside by the reception. So please go along, raise questions with Ranulf personally, and go and have a look at his book. Thank you very, very much. Thanks We've so much. thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs>